And this is a presentation on how to write with AI. I took some of the slides from the class presentation that I did, uh, and I do some demonstrations. We've gone into much more depth, but this is a good basic. So AI tools can be used for drafts, proofreading, translation, editing, analysis, coding, graphics, just, just a lot of opportunities to use AI. There are a lot of tools, ChatGPT, Gemini, Microsoft's Copilot, Claude, Bianthropic, Perplexity, uh, Grammarly is one that's focused specifically on writing. Canva is a graphics and content creation tool. They have a magic write function as well. And then there's just much more. So we typically might write emails on a regular basis. And so we might be writing an email to a friend or a family member, or we might be writing, you know, fiction. You can use AI for writing stories. You can use AI for writing nonfiction, descriptions, explanations, how to uh, as well. A lot of these may not be things you've thought about. Uh, you can use it for writing scripts for uh, videos or uh, presentations or audio scripts. You can use it for creating social media posts. Meta, which is the company that owns Facebook, has its own AI that's available in the WhatsApp app that you can utilize. And so it's available to utilize for that. And But you can use almost any AI for creating something like social media posts. A lot of people that have to do marketing need to create a lot of social media posts and AI can give them a head start on a lot of those things. You can use it for just creating notes. You can create a podcast. So they're just all kinds of, of mechanisms you can use for writing. It's just that there's many, many different types of AI writing that are available. So they all work pretty much the same. They're called uh, generative transformers. They create content based on a prompt. They work like a chat, but basically you're asking the AI to do something for you almost exactly like you'd ask a person. So what they have is they have a language model. They understand and learn how we use language, English, German, French, Spanish, Cantonese, etc. And they, the software studies it and gets a better idea of what's necessary to do and how it does it. And then it learns a little bit about how that language works and gets better and better and better at creating content based on its understanding of language, very much the way human beings learn about language. As children, we learn our vocabulary, we listen to words, we see how phrases are used in context, we get ideas of expression and tone and style, and, and we learn about language. AI is learning about language the same way a human being would learn about it, only it's computer software that's doing it, not a, a person. It learns from feedback. So a lot of the AIs have ways people can provide feedback and there are human trainers. AI is always learning just like a human being can always learn to create a, and use language better. The AI can learn from feedback and human beings can provide feedback. This thing called generative predictive text, GPT, is the terminology. What it does is it the AI predicts what it thinks should be the next word based on a database and understanding of what that language that it learns about. So just like we kind of anticipate what somebody might be going to say, what I could say, I'm going to go to lunch or the bathroom or a meeting or something like that. We kind of have in our brains the ability to kind of make assumptions about what to expect. And the generative predictive text part is what has made AI so useful for people in their everyday activities. And this predictive part isn't only text now, it's graphics, it's visuals, it's 
charts, images, etc. And so you're just seeing it used. But GPT is generally used as a term that applies to AI that can generate something for us. Even you know rewriting things is a good is a form of generative. It kind of determines what you want. Okay, it doesn't know who you are, but it makes some assumptions about the kind of response you might want from it. But you can fine tune that, and that's what is called the science of prompt engineering. And we're going to learn a little bit about that. But you could say. I want something casual, I want something friendly, I want something formal, I want something long, I want something short. If you tell it more about what you want, it's going to give you a, a better response based on what it is you want. But you don't have to tell it anything. You can just say, write a, you know, a story about a butterfly, and it'll write a story about a butterfly. And we'll see what happens when we do that. So it uses text based on what it thinks is the next most likely word to be used. It has a science behind it that understands what it is likely to use a word, and it keeps track of everything. So if you're, it's creating a sentence, it's creating a story, it's creating a paragraph, it's creating an email, creating a script, it understands and keeps track of what it has written already, and then makes a prediction on what it thinks the next best word ought to be. And it's just so amazing that it does it. It's like talking to a person. And that's the whole idea is that it's a, the idea is that it is similar to talking to a person. And you should think of it as talking to a person as well. One thing to be careful of with all AI is that it may not be 100% accurate on factual information. You should always check facts on it to make sure it's 100% accurate. It's getting better and better and better, but it's not completely 100% in all situations. This is where it's made companies that may want to provide things like uh, call center responses. They may not always do it, but in some cases now with the right training, just like you train an employee to do a job better, with the right training, an employee will get better at doing a job. With AI, with the right training, it gets better and better at doing its job. And so it's just like behaving more and more like a person, which is kind of scary in some ways, but it's also kind of expands the use of what it can be used for. And companies want to be safe. They don't want us to get a wrong answer on something. And so they're very careful about using it in situations where we might get an answer about a particular topic or subject. But for us searching the web, we're going to get what the AI produces, and it's up to us to make sure it's it's accurate. So how do you use it? Okay, so you're basically asking a computer to generate text. In this case, it's writing. Joe Novak did a great a presentation on graphics and visual and visual prompts and he's he's really good at doing those and so i recommend you take a look at at those or you can reach out to joe through chat uh on our platform tech explorer uh, he's there and you can ask him when he's doing something again and he enjoys uh doing those types of things i don't do graphics in a class that much but i use it but I use a lot of writing. I'm asking a computer to generate text, and you are asking a computer to generate text as well. Instead of you typing it, you're asking the computer to type it for you. And it'll make assumptions unless you're specific with what you want. The more specific you can be, the more you communicate to it what you want, and you, you almost are better off thinking of it as a human being that you're talking to and saying, I want you to do it this way. And the more you tell it about how you want it done, the better it will do. So if you want something written in German, it'll write it in German. It, it doesn't matter. It'll write it in, in French. If you want it translated, it'll translate. If you want it write, written for a business letter, it'll write it in a business letter style. If you want to write it as a personal note, It'll write it as a personal note. So you can make a lot of assumptions. 
like I say, think like you're asking a person to do something. Even though it's a computer and it's on your screen and you're typing something in, think of it like you're asking a person what it is you'd like it to do. And the more specific you can be, the better the results you'll get. And you you just probably don't understand how to be specific. And so we're going to go through that. This is called how to do prompts. And this is what we're going to show examples of, okay? We're going to talk about the basics of prompt engineering. That's the scientific technical term given to what do you type in in order to get the results you want. And so people in the workplace that are doing jobs are getting training on how to do prompt engineering. Because if you can create letters to customers faster or better responses to project assignments or do work better in, in the workplace, you can save time. And this is where AI is being used in the workplace is helping people get drafts done a lot faster. So the first thing you have to do is tell the AI, what do you want it to do? Do you want it to write an email? Do you want it to write a script? Do you want it to write a how-to? Just what is it that you want it to write about? And is it about flowers? Is it about gardening? Is it about travel? You know, What is it that you want it to do? You're giving it some instructions. Then you might want to give it a context or a situation like I've only got a few days or I want this written as a, a familiar letter. I want it written in a an environment where or, or style that's different. So you can define the situation that you want or the context that you want to give it. And then you want the format. Do you want it as a, a paragraph? Do you want it in bullets? Do you want it as a table? You can you know, define those things. You can even ask it for an image because the AI models have become what they're called multimodal, where you can type in a request and say, I want a picture uh, or a graphic, and it'll generate a graphic as opposed to a text response. Uh, or it'll, and, and so there's different formats. And then the tone or a style, you can say, write it like you're a, a classic, you know, Charles Dickens author, or write it in the style of, of a, you know, a foreign, you know, the person that doesn't speak English very well. You can give it that that approach and ask it to do things in different tones or styles. And then you want to ask it to take on a a role or a person. Write this as a an executive. Write this as a human resource manager. Write this as a personal friend that has a close relationship, write this as a family member, or write this as a fictional character, or even, you know, pretend you're writing this as a as an animal that doesn't speak very well, uh, or somebody that has a perspective on life as an alien or something like that. So these are all the aspects of prompt engineering that generally give you the a better prompt. Now, businesses have to be aware of these things because every time they ask an AI for a response, they're using up a resource. And, and so they only have so many prompts they can enter per user account. And so they get charged if they start to use more prompts or they have to pay for a service for using more prompts. So the free services give what most of us need plenty of plenty of responses. And so we typically aren't you know writing letters all day long or writing scripts or writing, you know, audiovisual, writing how-to instructions or things like that. We're not doing that all day long, eight hours a day. We might write a couple of emails where you say, I think that I wonder if this email could be done better or something like that. Or I wonder if I could write a little how-to instructions for how to take care of something. So that's why prompt engineering is more important in uh, business and organizations because they do pay a fee for every time they enter a prompt. So the instructions are tasks. You know how you train an animal to do something, fetch, you train it to roll over, you train it to do something. You, you are asking the AI to do something for you. So it's 
similar to training in a dog. You know, that's why I took that picture is that you're just telling it what you want it to do. Okay. Quiet, bark, you know, stand up, whatever. The context or tone is has to do with the situation or the style that you use for it. As I mentioned, you could ask it to write it as a, a pop singer. You can ask it to write it in a a uh, situation where it's a formal presentation to a group of business executives, however, or a club meeting for people that really are very sophisticated or people that have, say, or sixth graders or people that are college, you know, science researchers and something. And then you can ask for it in different formats as a paragraph, a list, a table, how long you want it. Whether you want it as an article or a script, you can you can ask it to be different formats if you choose as well. And then tone and context are similar, but tone is more of a style uh, where you might want to ask it to be formal, informal, casual, friendly, those types of things. Context gives you say, well, write this as though it's being used for a letter to an employee that we want to tell them about a new medical plan we're offering to them. So that's a context as well. And then I mentioned the role or persona. Who do you want the AI to be? And how do you want them to behave? Now, some of these things will always be combinable. You don't always have to have a separate one, but you have the ability to ask the AI to do these things for you and give you different responses or different approaches. Now, some of the AIs, are helping to direct people that are new users towards, oh, what would you like me to do with this? Would you like me to make it friendly, shorter, longer, more exciting, less you know, formal? And, and so they have some built-in tools for helping you navigate through that. And you'll find that with various AIs. And then you can refine it. You know, you can actually upload documents and ask it to summarize things, or you could ask it for something different. If you didn't like the response you got, say, well, I'd like it. But it, it remember, you're kind of talking to a person. And so if you asked a person, hey, could you write uh, instructions for how to take care of a snake plant for me to give to my gardening club? And you got it. You say, you could look at it and say, you know, this is really a little too long or I'd like it to fit on one sheet of paper, or can you just highlight the top three things somebody should do? So you can refine it and ask it, just like we show talked about with travel planning. You can say, well, if I didn't have five days and I only had three days, what could I do? Or if I prefer seeing something historical, or if I like, you know, seeing, you know, museum, or if I like seeing evening activities, dinner, you know, you can ask it for different types of things. So that kind of refining is helpful to be able to get you focused on something that gets you almost all the way there, or in many cases, all the way there. I'm showing you the non-paid version of ChatGPT. It's got a big screen here, and you basically put in a message here that explains something. So one of the prompts that I have that I'm going to copy and paste here is... Um, how to take care of a snake plant. And so I just asking it, just like I might ask it in a search, how to take care of a snake plant, okay? And I'm going to enlarge this a little bit for us. So if I click on the go button, it's going to give me a response here. Now, I didn't ask it for anything really specific. I just said, how do you take care of a snake plant, right? And it's giving me what it thinks is a good format. So it's telling me here are the you know seven steps. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight steps, I'm sorry. So I didn't ask it for any more detail than that. Now I can go to Microsoft Copilot and I can try the free version. Let's see, Copilot, let's see, I was looking at the web version. I'm not sure if I'll get to it right uh, or not, but um, let me go to a, a slightly different screen here, okay? And I'll show you on that. Uh, on the on Microsoft Copilot, you can 
uh, open up the Copilot option in the Edge browser. So let me stop sharing here and open up the Edge browser here. In Microsoft Edge, there is a Copilot button, or you can go to Copilot for Microsoft and use that. But it gives you the ability to do something. It opens it up on the right-hand column. And I'm just going to paste that same prompt in, how to take care of a snake plant. Now, it added indoors. It, it, it I didn't add that. It added indoors. So I'm just going to go here and submit it. And we will probably get very similar results, okay? So it gives me light, soil, watering, temperature, humidity, fertilizing, and you know five steps. And it gives me some references to some places. So that's a typical uh, you know request that you might make for somebody to say, hey, I'd like to uh, I'd like to get some information on how to do something. I'd just like to type in a prop, okay? Um, my Meta has, by Facebook, has a similar approach. And if I just type in, you know, how to take care of a snake plant, it's it's going to do something, you know, pretty similar, right? So let's see, it wants to confirm age. Let's see if I can log into Facebook here. Okay. And see if I can get it to take me to Facebook. There we go. Continue to it. Looks like it wants you to use your Facebook account with Meta AI. And so it's it exists in Facebook, it exists in WhatsApp, and you find the answers again are pretty similar, right? You know, instead, instead of five steps, it's seven, but it's a it assumes kind of made an assumption, oh, you want a snake plant care guide. Now the difference between AI and search is obviously if we did a search on Google, it would take us to some website links, but it would also give us a summary as well. Or you can go directly to Gemini and ask it to do some things for you as well. So let's take another format of this question and say, I want to explain to a beginner how to take care of a snake plant in 300 words. So I've started to give it a little bit of context and give it a little persona. I want it to be an explaining type of format. I want it to be to a beginner, and I want it to be specifically how to take care of a snake plant, and I want it to be formatted in 300 words. So let's see what happens. This is Gemini, and it's going to give us a, a pretty quick response here. And it even gives us a little picture along for it as well. Okay, so it, it goes to evaluate Gemini's statements. It checks it with Google search, which is kind of nice because it sees if it's got other things. And Google does give you the ability to share and export something to put it as a draft and email right away if you use Gemini. So Gemini, because it's a Google product, is tied directly to <laughs> Gmail, makes it easy to use and format that in Gmail. So you can see they're all pretty similar, but but you know how you do these formats can be a little bit different depending on the type of thing you might want to try and get out of it. Let's go back to ChatGPT and let's try another type of prompt where I want something that says, what is a right, I want it to write a scientific explanation of what a snake plant is and its characteristics. And I can even say for biologists, okay? It'll write a scientific explanation, including the Latin phylum information, what it belongs to, a much more scientific explanation because I asked it to be scientific as opposed to how to take care of it, right? So you can see how just asking the question in slightly different ways can get you a very different response from the AI in terms of what it writes. Now, you may not need a scientific explanation. And so you know, maybe you want something that's a 
a little better, a different response where you'd like to get a some plants similar to a snake plant for indoor gardening, and you'd like it formatted as a table with one column with the table of plants, another column, the size, another column, their care requirements, and you wanted about 10 plant choices because you're thinking of buying an indoor plant. So this is another way to ask it to write something. And so it's going to write and create a table for us that we can use. And it's going to give us the care requirements and the size and the characteristics that, that we might think about. And we could you know, print this out or take it to our gardening you know, st uh, supply store and take a look at these and do it. But all I did was just ask it for a table. And I wanted a list of plants similar to a snake plant or gardening in one column. So it's not, it, it's something you can utilize in a variety of ways. So let's take another type prompt that has to do more with maybe a letter for business writing, which I don't do too much, but you know, somebody might do. And we'll go into Gemini, for example, here, and we'll create a new prompt here. And we'll type this in. And this is a prompt that says, I'd like to write, I'd write a thank you letter to whoever someone who applied to a job, but we chose not to offer it to them but I want it to be in a friendly tone, okay? And why not, right? Okay, so yeah. let's see. It'll write the letter for me. Very common, you know, short, sweet, to the point. You know, you don't really say a whole lot in those types of letters, but says, thank you for taking the time to apply for X job. If I had specified the job and I had specified the company and we carefully reviewed all the applications, uh, unfortunately, we won't be moving forward with your application at this time. We wish you all the best. Those types of things are are pretty helpful to be able to. But I'm going to say create some social media posts for less than 15 words long about things people who are traveling to the Caribbean should be careful about. So let's see what kind of response we'll get with this. And Claude will you know, go out and create some things for us. Here are some brief social media posts. Heading to the Caribbean, check hurricane forecast daily during your trip, stay informed. Caribbean bound, pack emergency supplies, know your hotel's evacuation. And, and it asks a follow-up question, would you like me to generate more or elaborate on any of these? Okay, so uh, I could take some of this and I could say, well... You know, I could say, yes, I, I'd like it to do something. I'd like it to uh, reply to Claude here. Here's my reply. And I could say, uh, write a 100-word article about point number two. Okay, Caribbean bound pack emergency supplies. Okay. And it understands what point number two, it understands the second point, <laughs> and it's just going to write a 100-word article for me right away. So it's it's really fast. It's just a matter of, of asking, and these are some practical things. Okay, essential items to include. Okay, so it's getting this from the web, from resources, from things it's learned, and other types of things as well. But let's let's take it. A little bit different way. Let's start a new prompt here in Chat GPT, a new chat. And I'm not logged in, so my chats are not saved. If I use my uh, pro account, my chats are saved, and I also get more resources to it. But I'm going to say, you know, write a story about a butterfly. Okay, so maybe you've got a card or birthday or something you want to have somebody be aware of. So it's going to write a story about a butterfly. Okay. It, it gave it a name, Aurora. Uh, her wings shimmered. She was known for grace. She noticed the young caterpillar. It, it, uh, Oliver was the caterpillar's name. You know, it's like, okay, they became Aurora and Oliver you know, became friends. Okay. Not a bad story. Okay. So 
Okay, now I can say make uh, Aurora into a lion. And it, now it's going to make Aurora into a lion and change the whole context of the story. Okay, so I can ask it to do that. And this is the free version of ChatGPT. It, it, it's doing this type of thing. So it says for smarter responses, upload files and images. You have to sign up, but you can upload images. And if I just want to go to, say, Gemini here, and I want to do a new prompt, I can say something like, write a story for a six-year-old that helps them learn about plants in the desert. So for a teacher that wanted to come up with ideas and projects and things like that, they can they can do it even for you know people that want to read things to their kids and get a story. Uh, you can you can do this and said, okay, these are plants, but it also says, would you like to hear about plant animals that live in the desert? And that was a pretty good story. You could say, you know, that's that's just all the feedback we need to do. It's easy to understand. Okay, so we're going to submit that. This is the human feedback part of AI. So I'd like to see, yes, write a story about animals. And again, it's going to remember this is for a, a child, you know, so it's not for an adult. Okay, so now... Write it for an adult as though you are Charles Dickens. How about let's see what comes up with in the heart and it and it's gonna try and copy that style of writing, uh, you know, in the terms of the, the vernacular and the context and the vocabulary that Charles Dickens would use for writing something. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of, of what you can do and how you can do it in a variety of ways. Now, one of the things that I use a lot is I use, I write a lot of emails and I use a software package called Grammarly. Let's see if I can find it here and make sure I've got the right sharing. Grammarly is a free tool. You can actually install it on your computer and it pops up with a little G symbol whenever you're writing something. And so it doesn't matter what you're working in. If you're working in Word, if you're working in Notes, if you're working with Google Docs or whatever, it's it's uh, set up on your Mac or Windows. They have versions for both. Uh, Grammarly's got 40, 50 million users around the world. They're extremely well known as a copy editing, and they've been incorporating AI as a writing partner. Very specific is an email that I'm writing in Outlook. Okay. And what you see in this lower right hand corner is what pops up because I have Grammarly running in the background on my Mac. Same thing would happen. As soon as you start creating text, the Grammarly tool recognizes it. Now, there's two things that are here. There's one is a review function. Uh, let me get this a little bit better oriented here so we can see it. So if I have this review function here, let me close this to get this noise out of here. Okay, there we go. So if I have this review function in the text and I click on it, it pops up a window that gives me a better version. Okay, so if I say, well, hi, Bob, I just wanted to check in to see with you if you're planning to be at the club meeting Friday. We've got a good agenda and I think you might find it. And it corrects, it says, hi, Bob, I just wanted to check in with you to see if you're planning to attend the club meeting. Okay, so if I click on use this version, it's changed it, and it's also looked at this other text in the footer, 
and I can dismiss that if I want it. Now, the other way to use it is to use a little plus button here. This opens up the AI Assistant in Grammarly, and so it prompts you for some ideas on tone and style and other things. So it's like, right, you know, politely ask for an update. You can you know, use it for prompting. You can improve it, sound confident. So it has little suggestions for you that might help you write it a little bit better.